<laughs> but I'll just have to listen and uh, you won't have to look at my ugly mush. <laughs> okay, can, can you see what's on screen, Peter? Yes, yeah, I've got everybody right. on the screen. Okay, so that, I'm, that, I'm with that, you, I'm with you. That's Hi fine. everyone, some I know, some I don't. <laughs> Hi Pete. There's a, there's a, there's a oh, Linda. Hi. 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 Hi, Susie. Yeah, see you. <laughs> We're in Austria. But it's oh, yeah. oh, yes. <laughs> what are you doing over there? <laughs> you, you lucky people being in Austria. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of snow. <laughs> the only snow we're seeing. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, the Christmas decorations. We're, Lynn's putting them back up. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got my tree up. <laughs> Have you really? I'm doing it Swiss style, you know, and it's still there till February. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Ali, I might leave and come back in again on my mobile. You, try, you that. try that, Peter, no problem at all, mate. Okay, I'll try. Hold on, I'll leave this one anyway. <laughs> Uh, you can hear us. Yeah. Can you hear us, Ali? Yeah, I, I can hear everyone at the moment. If, you, if you're talking, I can hear you. Cool. <laughs> okay, I'm just waiting for a, a couple more people, and then we've hit 30, so I'll get started in a minute. So um, um, I'm not sure how many more. If any more come in, I'll, I'll just add them in as we start going, but I'll, I'll get started in a minute. But is uh, everyone doing okay? Yep. Yeah, thanks. Hang <clears throat> in Hanging in. Good. Uh, <laughs> we're there. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> How's everything with you, Ali? Yeah, uh, all, all, all going good, apart from, you know, just getting a little bit bored yeah. now. And um, <laughs> um, unfortunately, the dog got injured last week, so we've had to stop the dog walks, which is... Uh, hampered us somewhat but we're, we're we're now back on um those hopefully as of today he's been out for a five minute walk so um off the lead which is good so yeah but apart, apart from that we're we're doing all right julie's just finishing her lunch and going to join in one second so uh, uh yeah we're, we're all right we're getting there you've worn out your dog <laughs> <laughs> i think he's worn us out he's uh he, he doesn't stop once he gets going <laughs> So we're going to get the weather reports back again at the weekend. Yeah, you, you're possibly going to get a little um, country file <laughs> update. Yeah, towards the towards the end of the week. So be prepared for that. Yep. So, oh, got a few more people to let in. All right, Peter's going to try again. As we get on. All right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Yeah, but when they speak, they come on the screen, so no. Oh, we want to see everybody on the screen. No, I'm just wondering how many we, we get seen. Mm -hmm. But it's yes. Okay, you. there's there's people gradually still coming in, so I'll just keep updating as we um as I'm going along. So uh, I'll get started, and because uh, because I'm I'm going for the cheap version, I think we're only going to get an hour. Um, so we'll just see how we do. It might cut us off, it might not. So um, we'll see how we all go. All right. Um, for those of you that don't know, <clears throat> I'm just going to introduce Mark Shaxted, um, who's going to be doing a little presentation during today, and he's going to be adding stuff in. So, Mark, if you just do something a little bit like wavy or movie, or there's Mark for those that don't know Mark. And. Um... <laughs> 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 left people. I think <laughs> Ali, I think you've got a mute all option. Uh, as I know, but <laughs> I can't touch anything. <laughs> well, if if we get any more calls from Sandy, I'll I'll go for the mute all. But I'll, 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 I'll at the moment. So, um, but um, <clears throat> what we're what we're going to do today is I'm just just going to go through a few little updates and um, um, a few little points from what's going on with us ski definition what's going on around europe what's happening with snow sports and um um i'm then also going to do uh, a little presentation just a just a short snippet presentation on on an idea i've come up with um mark's got one as well which mark's going to do and then you you guys can all decide who's his best at the end of it and uh, if you choose mine you get a prize if you choose mark's you don't so it's highly <laughs> All right. um, What's the prize? Yeah, back that up, Bally. What is the prize? The prize is a ski definition hoodie. 
I can't compete, so just so you're all aware, you're finishing with the second best presentation then. <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got a little update from Pete Gillespie at the Snow Centre as well. Um, he's done a little video for us, so I'll, I'll show you that. And, um, and then, yeah, we want to we wanna try and get some ideas from you guys as what you'd like to maybe try and um, do if we do more of these regularly. And we're planning on trying to do them through February and then possibly into March. And up until hopefully we can then get back um, skiing again, uh, back at the snow centre or one of the indoor um, centres. And, um, um, yeah, and then eventually when we get back to the mountains, all right? Um, so I'm going to start off with... Welcome everybody, and we hope you're all doing well. And um, oh, I've just seen Richard Ballard there has got a nice little ski definition hoodie on. Good man, like like your style. This is the one. This is the prize, though. No, it's a much better one than that. Could we get uh, choice of colour. You might do. Yeah. Don't, don't, push push your luck. don't push your luck. Um, um, yeah, welcome everyone, and hope everyone's doing all right. And lovely to see people's faces and and um, see that everyone's still alive and well and doing doing okay. Um, un unfortunately, just recently we we had to cancel uh, what we were planning on doing for March in um, in Europe over in Spain, and then what we were going to plan to do for April as well. Um, just with the travel restrictions, with everything that's still in place, um, it's just going to make it impossible to to get out there and um you know we're, we're hoping to get back to the um, um the mountains if we can in the summer we'll, we'll plan for something in the summer if it needs to be the autumn winter then then we'll start planning on getting back to the the mountains and the courses over in in europe at some point in the future um we will release dates and we'll place it onto the website so everyone will be up to date and everyone will know and we'll obviously put it onto social media as well so um, as soon as we know and as soon as the governments allow us, and it's not just obviously the UK governments, it's, it's what the governments allow us to do in Europe as well. So once we can, we're not going to look to try and sneak through loopholes. We're not going to try and go around certain countries to get into another country. We'll, we will just follow what the rules allow us to do. And once it's safe enough for us all to get back in place, then uh, uh, we'll get out to the mountains. But our, um, our first port of call will obviously be uh, the indoor centres and, and Hemel Snow Centre. And the, their provisional date is for March, um, but I'll, um, I'll keep everyone again updated. If that happens, great, but it, it might not. The schools might not be back until March, end of March, April time. So possibly the snow centre and leisure won't be open again until uh, the schools are at least back. So we'll have to keep, keep waiting on that. But we'll, we'll keep everyone updated and we'll, uh, we'll just see what's possible. Um, the... The mountain courses, as I say, we've had to cancel March and April. We're gonna, we've transferred a few people over. We've refunded a lot of clients. So um, hopefully everyone that wanted a refund or needed a refund or we felt should get a refund has got that. A few, about two people have transferred on to next year, um, which, um, which we were fine with. And that was just for course only. So hopefully come, come April, we're back on um, a fresh start and we can push everyone forward and, and go from there. So um, the... The current situation in, in Europe, some of you may or may not know that obviously France ski resorts are still closed, Italy ski resorts are still closed, um, Spain and Switzerland do have theirs open um, and that's if you are in the country, in the region and living in that, that area you can go and ski um, and that's the same for Austria as well. Um, some of the other countries are still doing certain things to try and open up or to hopefully do things into, into March and April. And that'll possibly be more of the higher um, glacier resorts. But again, it's, it's all on hold until everyone fully knows exactly what's happening. But um, we're going to start adding on to the, the Ski Definition website um, links to certain countries and to certain resorts. So if people do want to know more information, then we'll try and get that out and get that um, updated as regularly as we can. I do know um, um, the likes of Planet Ski, um, a web-based web company, and they, they do offer lots of current up-to-date information and they tend to be quite quick on getting lots of updates out so if people want to look on um, uh, Planet Ski uh, you can normally find information there um, but we will try and keep keep everyone in the loop as to what's happening and when Ski Definition and, and our partner companies will continue and start running courses again so 
we'll um, we'll keep uh, keep everyone updated. All right. Um, we're going to um, um, start to uh, move forward, try and offer new products in the snow center and different products or different courses when we get to the mountains. And again, when we start to put all of this in place, we'll just email everyone, place it on the social media and people can then come back and ask us certain questions. Or if you've got an idea of a course um, or if you want to do a bespoke package for yourselves, um, then obviously just get in contact and let us know. And um, um, we'll just see what we can do. With regards to uh, the European rights and to, to where people can work, um, there are some instructors which are fortunate and some instructors which are unfortunately not going to be allowed to work. So um, I've been doing a lot of um, information gathering and a lot of um, uh, submitting of paperwork to various countries and uh, to different regions. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in a very slow process of hopefully obtaining my Irish passport, but I've just been told recently that could be up to... 18 months that I might have to wait for that so um, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that but besides that I've, I've um, I'm legally allowed to work in in Spain uh, I'm legally allowed to work in Switzerland I've submitted the paperwork to legally be allowed to work in France um, we're getting all the information for Norway um, starting to do the same process in Italy um, I've got the process started in Austria um, so they I'm, I'm pretty much covering off as, as many countries as I can. And um, uh, we're, we're trying to do that as an association for IAZ as well. We're trying to find out where instructors that are qualified through IAZ um, will be allowed to work. And we're gonna try and update uh, instructors through the IAZ website and social media um, as to where they can go and what they can do and, and hopefully make it as simple as possible for uh, everyone to be able to still keep skiing and possibly keep teaching in the mountains as well, okay? Um, just a, a quick thank you to any of you that are on the call today that uh, did vote for me uh, to go back onto the board of directors. Um, I did, did get successful, um, thanks to a lot of your votes, which is uh, very helpful and kind of you all. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. And we're, we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes to um, try and push the association forward. So there'll be lots more updates on that coming as well. Um, rather than me just keep talking, I'm just going to play you a quick little video from... Um, uh, Pete Gillespie, just as a, an update on what's happening at the Snow Centre. We've just done a little um, video for us yesterday, so I'm just going to play this now for you. And uh, you can all see this, hopefully. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Can you see the beautiful Peter Gillespie? <laughs> he could have smiled. He could have done, but yeah. <laughs> Let, let's see if he does in the video. So I'm just going to play this, all right? It's only about 90 seconds. Hi guys, and uh, thanks Ali for inviting me to say a few words on behalf of the Snow Centre. Uh, well, here we all are, you know, we're through January now. We always knew that was gonna be the, the tough month um, because it generally is a tough month, it's cold and miserable, all your bills come in. And along with that, uh, it's a real skiers month. And as I'd imagine everybody on this call is a skier or snow sports enthusiast, it was always gonna be tough. But it looks like there's some, some light on the horizon. I mean, Ali and myself have been in contact all summer, all since the pandemic. And, um, and we've always said that spring will be king. You know, the weather gets warmer, the vaccines are being rolled out. But obviously, by no means are we out of the winter, but we're certainly looking at a brighter future. Um, now, whether we get to the Alps this, this winter or this spring, well, that's, yeah, that's debatable. But we'll certainly be skiing again, I think, soon. I can't give you a date. We don't have a date. But as I say, spring looks, looks highly likely. Um, and then, yeah, maybe we can get to the glasses and we can travel. If not, then I'm pretty sure we'll have a fantastic summer at the snow centre, a lot of pent up demand. Um, you, myself, other than a few turns on Ivanhoe Beacon, I've not put a turn down since 19th of December, which is the longest period of time I'm not skiing for myself. And actually, I've passed the milestone of not having visited the Alps for a year, which again, for someone that's in the Alps, constantly is, is crazy. But listen, guys, it's, it's on the up. Re really hope you enjoy your, your meeting with Ali. If I can join, maybe I will. Um, if not, then I'm sure there'll be ones in the future so stay safe, stay positive, stay focused. We will be back, I'm pretty sure, very soon, making turns and doing what we all love doing best. Cheers, guys. Okay, so there's, there's the cheery Mr. Gillespie. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, as for pretty much most of you and um, for Pete, myself, Mark and, and all the enthusiasts out there, obviously, it's, it's been a long time 
um, since we've been to the mountains and obviously a bit of a shorter time since we was in, um, in Hemel, but hopefully um, March, April, May, we will be, we will be getting back in there. And um, uh, I know the guys at Hemel are doing an awful lot behind the scenes to, uh, to keep everything prepared and ready. And uh, they're maintaining the snow, the, the systems there, the, um, the whole working environment. It, it, it's changing on a daily, weekly basis. So hopefully everyone will all be back in there and we'll see the, the lovely, smiley Mr. Gillespie's face again at some point. Um, but um, yeah, we're, we're not 100% sure if it's going to open in March. It, it, it might be delayed again until the end of March, April. But again, we'll, we'll keep, everyone, um, keep everyone updated on, uh, on what's going on with that. Okay. Um, Myself and Mark are going to do a couple of little presentations in a, in a short while. And they're, they're just a couple of um, PowerPoints that we've put together. And it's, it's just ideas we've had. We've been chatting over the last week or so. And, um, and what we want to try and do going forward is to try and keep everyone engaged in snow sports and, and try and keep everyone's spirits up. We want, we want to try and do a few more of these, whether it's regularly once a week, whether it's during the day or during the evening. Um, and just want to talk about various different topics. So um, in, the, in the chat box, um, if you want to put down, or you can say it if you want to say it, if everyone sort of puts their hand up and we can go through one at a time. Um, we want to try and get some of your ideas as to, as to what you'd like to see from us, what you'd like to um, have us cover or to, um, um, to do. So if you've got an idea, you can either stick it in the chat and we'll, we'll write it down, or you can tell us now what you'd, what you'd like to see and. Um, um, hear from us and um, we've got quite a few ideas that me and Mark have been sort of talking over and, and different presentations we can go through um, but we want to know what you guys want to see um, it's going to be pointless if we're just talking about subjects that we like because um, you'll lose interest so we want to make sure that we've, we've got you engaged and they are your ideas so does anyone want to kick off anyone want to say anything or anyone want to put something in the chat um, feel free to go for it yeah, I did just want to add there that if you do have any questions during the presentations or anything like that, put them in chat and um, I'll try and curate those questions for, for Ali while he's presenting and, and he'll try and do the same for me. So uh, we'll, we'll use that chat as best we can to help out. I'll say, so being, being a bit selfish, I'm looking for uh, coaching on bumps and powder skiing. <laughs> so that's, that's my... That's my goal. You know that, Ali. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Uh, and I'm, and I'm sure there's other people out there would like to have, um, have something with that as well. So we can, we can easily put something like that together. And, and it's just simple ideas like that, guys. What, what would people want to um, see? What, what, what do you want us to go through? What would you like us to talk about? And, um, and then we can sort of put our, our thoughts to it. Anyone else? Oh, um, Ali, just as a note at the end, maybe try and make sure that you save this chat because I, I, looking at things already is going to be a lot to remember. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> right, yeah. I'm going to buy some skis, Ali, soon. It's my birthday in January and I've got permission now. You to get want to buy skis. some skis? And I'm really unsure about heavy or light. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't like the light ones that I've skied on when I've been in resorts. Okay. So you, it's so been you... a long time since I've been on heavy, heavy ones. Yeah. But the light ones have confused me. What do you think for a woman? I know it's different with men because they're a lot stronger and they can yeah. push down the front much more easily. I mean, Equipment, and I'm sure Mark might have his view on this, and I'm sure others might do as well. Um, with equipment, obviously, it is very personal. So if you don't like a light ski, then I would obviously say, yeah, definitely go for a, a heavy ski. But it's then finding the right balance between if you get a ski that's heavy, it could be a high-end performance ski, which you might find that you won't be able to use properly because it's, it's very mm -hmm. stiff, it's very awkward to, to bend and manoeuvre. Um, it, it is one of those cases where, obviously, if you can try it, before you actually buy it, then, then brilliant. And I know some of the, the indoor centers do offer that as a, um, a ski test sometimes with various brands going in. And I, I would imagine that once the, set, the indoor center is open, um, the manufacturing brands are, are desperate 
to get sales at the moment because obviously people haven't been buying snow sports equipment as much as they used to. Um, so they, they're going to need to get their products out there. So I would imagine a lot of the brands will try and use the likes of mm -hmm. Hemel, Beans, Manchester and offer ski tests. And, you know, if, if you get a chance, go, go along and try it. Um, but if you are looking for something heavy, it's, I would say, be careful on going to the top end of the range where you might find the heaviest ski because they will become the most difficult ski to use because you're going to really need to, to bend those skis. And, and when they're heavy and stiff, it, it becomes very awkward. So um, if you can yeah. go for anything that's got the word head attached to it, then that's normally <laughs> the best ski to use. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, just, to, just to chime in here while you're talking, because uh, I mean, Go with head. I mean, would you like to show who's number one on the uh, Fizz brand rankings there, Ali? Would you like to yeah, show it, that first? Is it head or is head number two? It, head head anyway. is currently number two. There, there's been a few races <laughs> where head have not quite been on, on their game, but wait till the end <laughs> of the season. Uh, just, just, <laughs> to on, on the, just to chime in on the choosing Probably a ski uh, topic, um, I actually last year ended up trying out a bunch of different skis for, for two reasons. One, to find out more about what I liked but also to see if I could try to decode some of the stuff that manufacturers write on their websites, because, you know, obviously no manufacturer goes on the website and writes what's bad about their ski. And I've kind of discovered two things. One, knowing about what the construction materials are used in a ski and how those construction materials are used can tell you almost everything you need to know. So what I would imagine has happened to you trying a light ski and you didn't like it, and this is purely a guess, but it probably didn't give you grip when you wanted grip. It probably just didn't handle in, in a lot of the situations that you wanted to. Um, it, it maybe was too soft or, or whatever, whatever kind of happened. And so you might think of jumping to a, to a stiffer ski, a heavier ski, which then leads you down the road of having a ski that's got more metal in it, uh, which tends to make a ski heavier. But the construction materials now, it, it's a wonder what a lot of the manufacturers are doing with carbon. Um, and they're all doing things a little bit differently. So I, I ended up finding this uh, this company or this this YouTube channel called Ski Essentials. Uh, I think their website is skiessentials.com. They do a lot of ski reviews. And, and these guys, I asked the guy, when you look at the construction of a ski and the technology of it, can you can you do you know what a ski is going to be like before you get on it? And he said probably most of the time he can, although there's a few skis that surprise him. Um, so I'm kind of on a bit of a mission to try and decode some of that information. So maybe there's um, we could go through some ski examples uh, in a later in a later presentation to give you a better an idea of what to look for. Mm. Um, I don't I don't know if light versus heavy is is the argument because you want basic. I, I think a light ski is good depending on what you want to do with it. But if you want the performance, then it needs to have other characteristics too. So don't necessarily think light or heavy. A um, little bit of knowledge about construction and, and technology can, can do that and honestly the technology that that manufacturers write on the website that's the marketing mumbo jumbo that's just how they've that's just how they've used construction materials that's all technology is I should um, come here as well please snow and rocket hemel hempstead will usually have um skis that you can use to try out on the slope yeah they're, they're very good about it i i Ali knows I've bought a few pairs of skis over the last few years, but yeah, Snow and Rock are very good. They they will you just you know leave a credit card with them and take it upstairs for a couple of hours and have a good run with them. Um, they stock most, but I also think you need to decide. You know, for me, it was about what type of skiing that I was going to do. Was I always going to be on piste? Was I going to get more off piste? You know, I'm desperate to be a better powder skier. So for myself, I went for an all mountain ski to give me that one ski. Sort of, it's good on piste, it's good off powder. It's not really good in deep powder because it's not big enough. But I wouldn't buy it over a hundred mil for average skiing. Um, I just don't think it's necessary. Um, but I think also just ask yourself, you know, if you're going to spend all your time on piste, you might want a really good piece ski. Um, if you do get off piste a little bit maybe the starts of an all mountain you know somewhere in the sort of 90 mil range 80 mil range that uh, gives you that a better platform underfoot can i make a That's observation to me yeah. um just a real quick one and ali will know where i'm coming from with this if if you ever decide you want to go uphill at all then you definitely need the light ski for that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and i I think, I think that might be the, um, one of the, the key points, Tim, there, is that 
it, it's finding what what you want the ski for and what you yeah. want to use it in particular area piece off piece whether it's um, for skiing around on all day and doing a mixture of different types of snow whether you're going to go steep or fat it, it, it is a case of choose the ski which is best for you sometimes people are driven by the colors and i'm not going to look at my wife julie when we're looking at um, um colors of boots and skis um, some people are, are driven by price point um, so some people will tend to say well yeah it's a little bit cheaper so i'm going to go for this type of ski it is about choose the ski which actually is going to benefit you the best and um if it is going to be something that you can use all over the mountain then yeah obviously an all mountain ski might be the way forward if you're going to trek uphill you want a light ski if you're going to go off piece and ski deep powder the whole time yet yeah, maybe 90 100 110 mil underfoot it, it's such a variety nowadays um compared to when i and possibly some of you all started all those years ago late 80s early 90s when it was just a straight ski and there wasn't much different in the construction or the weight of it. And as long as you liked that brand or that color, that, that was a ski for you. But nowadays, I think every brand has, has possibly got, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 different types of skis that you could choose from. And the best way is obviously get on the skis. I know Snow and Rock do it at Hemel. Mark, do Ellis Brigham do it still at Milton Keynes? I couldn't tell you if they still do it just because I haven't specifically gone and, and, and asked them and find out to, to, to borrow a pair of skis um, in yeah. recent memory, so I, I couldn't say. Yeah, I can confirm they do actually do that. I tried a few a few weeks ago, actually, before the lockdown. Okay, all right, cool. So, yeah. And can, can I just say a couple of things, Ali? Just don't be afraid to try other brands as well, because we all get very attached to the brands that we like. I mean, I, I always used to ski Rosin Hill skis after um, I, I, booked, I, I tried the upgraded pair to the pair that I was skied on for about three four years i hated them i just couldn't get on with them and um in the end i did i, I swapped to a, a solomon qst which is just for me a perfect balance because it allows me to ski a much longer ski um, because it has so much rocker which is really good for me uh, and it gives me the opportunity to you know off piste as well so you know it's just for me it was just that all-round ability and not having to carry too many skis and things like that but yeah, don't be put off by, you know, try a few brands because the, all of a sudden you one will just fit and it will just fit your type of skiing and, and that's what I went for. I mean, one of the things I want to do this year, the money that I've saved, and I've saved a lot of money, um, is, is look at getting the ski touring kit, upgrading, proper bindings, things like that. And a little bit of... Um, a little bit of ski touring training because it, it is a skill. I've done it for many years. I can do it. Some people have, some people haven't. You know, a little bit of training there, a bit of tips and tricks and stuff like that. I, I think that would be a, a good day's instruction, to be honest, if you get, get away with that. Ali? Yes. Is there going to be any sort of... Um, <laughs> ski touring is really something that I've not really considered in the past because it just seems like a lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, obviously, in the situation that we are now, you know, it, it does open up other avenues and things like that. Um, you know, a little chat on that might be good because I know the bindings are different. I've never had a pair of skins on my skis in my life, so I wouldn't even know how to put them on. So, you know, maybe a little chat on that might be good for those who are interested. Yeah, we, we, can, we can definitely do that, yeah. That's not a problem. And, um, obviously, it has become... Um, a lot more prominent recently because of what's happened across Europe, across the UK. Um, lifts not open, so people are accessing the mountain by walking up. And um, um, you know, just like skiing itself, um, ski touring, it's got a technique. If you do it correctly, it's quite straightforward. It's quite quite simple to do. If you do it badly, just like skiing, then you will get the aches and pains. You will find it tiring. It is. It can be heavy going. So um, um, it, it, it is great. I, I don't particularly love it myself because um, I prefer the upper lift, traverse, move off and go. But saying that, I, I've, got, <laughs> I've got most equipment here and it's a case at some point I might have to use it. it I, I might like to use it. I don't know because at the moment I'm just desperate to get back on skis and it might be something that I have to do at some point. So, um, but yeah, we can chat about that stuff, ski touring and equipment and stuff like that. No problem. The oh, other yeah. thing the, the, the other best use for it get about with their skis is that you know when you're binding your bindings, if you buy a non-adjustable pair, all right, means no, no one else is ever going to use your skis. They're going to be your skis. But 
they take a lot of weight out because the adjustable part of the binding is really heavy. It's most probably the heaviest part of the ski. Um, it also lowers your centre of gravity as well, which I think is quite a good thing. <laughs> Ali, just a quick, quick um, uh, comment on ski touring. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it, it's obviously uh, very attractive at the moment with the, the lifts not working. It is the most <coughs> dangerous year on record, I think. And um, there's been more people killed and more avalanches than ever before. So it's really, really important to take instruction and to go with a, a qualified leader or guide. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would back that up wholeheartedly, Jez. Um, that, that, the current situation that's going on at the moment, obviously there's amazing snowfall in Europe and in, and in the UK up in, up in Scotland and the north of England. Um, but if you, if you are thinking of doing it first time, if you are thinking of doing it uh, and you've experienced, still take someone that knows the area, take someone that knows what they're doing, knows the equipment. Um, it looks so tempting sometimes. And it is um, the picture postcard of the, the fresh snow, the sunlight. It, it can be so tempting, but um yeah great great words of advice jez and um um wholeheartedly get a guide get get an instructor get get someone that is experienced in what they're doing and for me personally i uh, if i wanted to go touring and go back country i would be taking a guide as well um my experience in off-piste skiing is skiing from lifts or skiing from piste um i haven't been back country or i haven't been touring um since i passed my level four uh, off piece mountain safety security course, which was in 2003. Um, so 18 years. So, if I was to do it, I would take a guide or someone with the knowledge and experience to be able to look after me. So, yeah, definitely, definitely. Ali, I'd also say that it's, it's loads of people have gone crazy, gone touring, and it's only been January, so there's been no time for the snow to settle. I mean, touring normally would take place late March and into April and May. Yeah. Um, so it's not, no real, apart from that, there's a massive of snow. There's no real surprise that so many people have been killed. And the other problem is that people are um, <clears throat> basically, when, you, when you're ski touring, you're going up routes that you don't normally go to and you, you end up in places where you're not quite so sure where you are because, you know, you can be adjacent <laughs> to a piece, etc. And people just don't, really look around them and see if there's Cirax and you know moving snow bases etc so and of course there's nobody up there actually policing the mountains so therefore people are just going off and then getting into difficulties yeah uh yeah to totally agree tim um just quickly david dawson david you've put um partly due to daylight hours what what, what was um where's your where are you coming from with that at the moment Oh, just unmuting myself. No, it was just in relation to the um, ski touring later in the season. I think that's that's one of the reasons um, why okay. it happens later in the season. Apart from the weather being a bit more predictable and the ski pack being more stable as well. But, uh, but certainly the daylight hours are, are massive. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I yeah, to totally agree. And um, um, yeah, just Kathy, going back to what you're saying, it, it, it's um, it's that temptation. The the, the snowfall is amazing. Um, sometimes the weather is absolutely um, awesome itself. You know, the sun's shining after the snowfall. I saw a video the other day of three days of constant snow in Val d'Isere, and then the next day it was just the picture postcard. Glorious sunshine, and it just tempts people. And even people with experience and knowledge, they get tempted to possibly go, like was mentioned earlier, to somewhere where they might not have been before, possibly haven't checked it out thoroughly. And um, uh, the, the temptations are just really high. Um, so we, you know, for us, we're, we're not going to be able to get out there at any point soon, but for those that are out there, you know, just pray and hope that they do follow and stick to what they should be doing and, and, and stay with someone, stay in the areas they know. And it's the temptations of the mountain, unfortunately, and, um, it's, it's going to catch people, um, on certain days. So, um, let's, uh, let's hope there's not too many more, um, following on for the rest of the season. It's interesting, one of the Red Bull guys on an interview who said um, when he has a, a, an amazing, when there's amazing powder skiing and it's the first bluebird day, he checks the weather forecast, he knows he's going to go, but he turns over in bed, goes under the duvet again, and he won't let himself get up till 11 o'clock in the morning because he knows if he gets up for first, first tracks, he won't be able to stop himself. 
So yeah. that's his rule. On a bluebird, perfect powder day, don't don't be the first one up there. Yeah. <laughs> Which is good advice, I think. Yeah, you know, it, and, and I'm sure the more time um, we were to spend with guides and people that do spend time or a lot more time than we do in researching avalanches, snowfall, conditions, weather, um, if we were to spend more time around those people, then we might be that bit more cautious as well. And we might take um, a slightly more cautious approach to what, what we're going to do. And um, I, I know for myself, when I was a youngster, I used to do, you know, crazy things and go crazy places. Whereas nowadays I, I do assess it a lot more. I'm very cautious. And especially because most of the time I'm with groups and I'm leading the groups and I'm the person that's in charge of where we're going. Um, caution is the first port of call. I'm always going on the on the slightly easier side rather than being tempted by the um, the lovely unknown and the, the steep pitches that, that could cause the clients, myself and everyone around us, a, a, a whole world of problems. So, um, you know, it's it's a thought process. And, and that, that thought process actually quite nicely links me into uh, my little presentation and I think a little bit about Mark's presentation. Um, I'm just thinking of time-wise because I don't want to bore everyone. Um, but we've, we're going to just do these couple of presentations. And if everyone's happy with that, we'll, um, we'll go through these. Is, is that good with everyone? Is everyone fine with that? Yep. I'll take that as a majority yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to some questions after. Um, but I'd just like to sort of just say before we do the presentations that <clears throat> both Mark and I have got... Um, quite a number of years of experience um, uh, between the two of us. And, um, you know, what, what I'm going to present now is, it, it's not something that particularly any association or any um, uh, governing body might deliver. This is just my thoughts. I just sat there the other day and wrote down a few things and um, had a chat with Mark. and We went back on uh, a couple of points. But um, it's just, just an idea. And it's just uh, something as a, a resource for you all. It's just a bit of an idea of something that we could talk about in a bit more detail later on um, down the month. And, um, but it's just uh, um, it's a few ideas I've got. I've put down onto a, a PowerPoint. And then I think Mark's got something as well. So we'll have a look at it. But there is no right or wrong. This is just an idea. And it's about the, the thinking and the thought process to, to get people going. Okay, so I'll... Uh, uh, I'll do my one first. I'm on a Zoom call. It's awesome. <laughs> All right, so the, the topic or the, the wording I've chosen is change your skiing. Ali. Yes. Ali, I think I've time to hit the mute all button there. All right, I'll... Uh... Bear with me once. Oh, here we go. Okay, so it's change your skiing. And I've, I've gone for looking at my thoughts, my process, my skills, and my understanding. And it, it's just looking more internally about what's going to happen externally. And it's about just trying to uh, uh, put a process in place that we can start to uh, internally plan and change and make things happen in a different way and um the, the, the simple little tagline that i've put at the bottom your thoughts give you the process to make the skills work only if you understand what you are trying to do and why okay i see a lot of people um when they're when they're skiing whether it's in the uk or in in the alps is that they're skiing and they're repeating a lot of um exercises and drills but sometimes they don't know what they're doing it and why they're doing it so it's the case of starting to look a little bit more internally and, and start with your thoughts and um i've just put at the top as a as a simple start off it's it show up um not feeling like skiing today go anyway give it a try but at that point you need to then start to think internally about what's going on and i've put find an anchor and um we all need a theory and a process to believe in we all need something that we we need to um, um catch on to and it gives us that inspiration to keep following it through 
And, um, you know, whether it's a theory from a, a governing body, whether it's from an instructor, whether it's from a centre, or whether it's something you've read in a book or seen on a, on a movie, it's just finding that anchor, something you believe in, and then putting that theory and process into place. And uh, you, you need to link at certain points within here, I've put that you go uh, step out of your comfort zone and the willingness to push to the next level. Now, this is something as, a, as an instructor, I see a lot of people aiming to do, but they don't fully commit to doing. And it's about trying to internally recognize that you, you need to push yourself and you need to uh, uh, give yourself a, uh, a push in the right direction so that you can go from one level to another. And that needs you to come out of your comfort zone. Uh, you need to just sort of break away from that. Looking at things from a different view. Um, sometimes we just repeat the same thing and expect a different outcome. But well, that's just the definition of insanity. It's, it's look at what you're trying to do. Look at it from a different viewpoint. The books, the videos, the theories. It, it's a case of starting to attack something from a different angle. But you, it needs to be attacked from within and you need to believe in that process. Okay. And then slow down. Take your time. Try and notice exactly what's going on the small things and the big things, okay? Don't rush through the whole process. Um, the last little section here is eliminate the excuses and create solutions, all right? This is a simple but powerful technique in changing your thinking. It's all about tapping into those emotions and eliminating the roadblocks that we spend so much energy focusing on. Instead, begin shifting your focus from the buts towards the hows, and it's how are we going to achieve it? How are we going to change what we're doing? How are we going to put a new process, new plan, and new skills in place? Okay, and it's uh, it's just trying to get that that thought process thought process right before you start moving into the process. And um, we've got to start somewhere. So you've got this lovely beginner skier, as in me down here. I'm the start end goal World Cup skier, and um, Beat Voice has gone on and won quite a few um, podiums and medals this this year. Um, but we all have to start somewhere. And, and that's the, the process has to begin. So it's about planning your change and um, the thoughts will allow you to plan your process. And uh, if, you, if you have a clear defined process, it becomes quite straightforward, but a lot of people will just jump on their skis, go out and just start to do something when they're on the hill. But it needs to start before that, before you get onto the skis, before you decide to put the skis on, there needs to be a process, a plan in place for you to start moving through these stepping stones, okay? We need to understand and we need to have the, the skill internal and external. And what I mean by the skill internal and external is we need to have the right idea of how the skill is worked, how it's used, how we implement that skill. The external is what is the outcome from that? Is it a, a skidded or a carved term, etc. Okay. But if we don't have it right internally and we're not sure on what that skill is, then the outcome will not be what we're trying to achieve. That's just making sure that we understand the skill internally and externally as well a couple of um uh, important words here or three important words honest accurate and realistic okay very very appropriate to trying to make changes and develop uh, your skiing or your your ability in skiing okay if we're not honest we're, we're not going to actually physically make any changes we need to be as accurate as we can but realistic i'm not going to go from being the skier I am to a World Cup skier in, in two months, in three months. It, it might take me years if I was to decide to do that. Uh, we need to be realistic on the time frame of how it's going to um, pan out for us. Um, awareness of the skill, developing the skill, acquiring the skill. And this sort of moves into the skill acquisition phase of when we, uh, we learn new skills and how we start to use them. Uh, it, get, it gets to the end goal of once, you can, once you've acquired the skills, it's, it's, you become adaptable. You can use the ski, skills sorry, in different ways. And, and that's what we're all trying to be able to achieve so that we can all become all mountain skiers or we can conquer the bumps, the powder, the steeps, the flat slopes. We can do a snowplow. We can do a carve turn. And um, if we become adaptable, then we tend to be able to use all of those skills. Okay. I've got a, a little video that I'm just going to uh, run through. And it's just some... Uh, little videos of Mark and myself skiing and uh, I'll talk through bits of it and I'll let other bits of it run and um, it is just looking at certain skills and I'll, I'll play this through Oh, 
I'm just gonna just gonna pause it there just for a moment. And one of the one of the things I hear from uh, a lot of people when I'm I'm teaching them or um, people that want to develop and improve their performances is if I take them back to doing a snowplow turn, they they tell me they don't want to do that. They don't want to go back into something that's a beginner scenario. But the fact that most good skiers or definitely most good instructors, the fact that we can accurately do these basic maneuvers of a beginner very well is because we do go back and we do practice these and we get one of the key words I mentioned on the last sheet was the accuracy and if you just look simply at the posture that I have in place with the hands the back the knees the ankles where I'm standing over my skin the, the posture is in place and the more I practice this obviously the better it's going to become as long as it's accurate it will become more ingrained as a good habit which is essential okay Mark, your video is a bit blurry. Good. I could have sent you better quality video if you'd asked, Ali. It was your phone. Very good, Ali. Okay, so just, just part of the, the sort of the running theme through this is how the skills are working and the, the posture, the balance, the movements. And there, there are differences between Mark skiing and, and my skiing, okay? But hopefully you're not seeing a too big a difference between the, the two skiers and the movements and the, how the posture works. And, and it's just, I want you to keep that in mind as we go on to the next slide when the, when the video does finish, okay? Seriously, I was just thinking of that thing. Nice round right shoulders. Nice arms. That's giddy. That could be it. Looks nice, doesn't it? Mm. I just want to climb in the screen. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the video has made you smile, not feel too sad that we're not actually out in resorts and we're not back on skis. And um, and as I say, the, the video was it's looking at the skill and uh, the movements, the posture, the balance, all of these things that we all, we all commonly know. And um, I, I've worked around the world in various countries in in europe australia and, and canada and, and other other places and um i've just put a picture here of some of the different governing bodies who i've done exams with um and i've just listed some of them below the picture the the five words across on the left hand side the balance posture movement steering and time they haven't changed from one association to another those those skills are in every single association i've i've worked for or, or delivered courses for or been an instructor in the system and um, they don't change but the understanding of how each of those fits in place the, the process on how we use them 
does get changed slightly. And it's making sure that we have that process on how to use these uh, efficiently. And that will start with our thought process and putting that in place, okay? The, the knowledge of the skills and how they work is essential to the input we place into our skiing. Choosing when, where, what, why gives us the desired outcome if used correctly at the right time, okay? Influence the knowledge of skill, okay? Reading, videos, discussions like we're doing now, writing stuff down, but experimenting. Experiment is one of the big things. And when you get back on skis, try to do things differently. Play around with what your, your skill set is. Don't just repeat the same thing over and over and over again. Once you get something working, then we start to practice and repeat that. But it's still playing around and experimenting as much as you possibly can. And the important phrase just at the bottom here is, don't be afraid of failure. We learn by our mistakes. Okay? And, and that is everyone. Every, every human being goes through that process. Okay? The last part is the, the understanding. Okay? And the understanding is, is bringing it all together. It's making sure that all the previous points that we've just sort of, I've talked about and mentioned, it all comes together as one. And that, that's, the, that's the overall outcome that we want. Okay? So the thought process is there so that you have your knowledge, the process to plan and achieve your goal, the skill on how they work and which skill you use, you begin to understand your possibilities, okay? You can then start to begin your development, your time frame. what can you do, the why can you do it, where can you do it, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And the understanding is, is part of the beginning process, but the end process as well. And um, it's to do with uh, making sure that you start with engaging with your, your thoughts, with the brain and um, hopefully when we uh, when we get back onto onto snow it's just using the using the brain as a tool as well it's there to help us i thank you all where has that was great ali thank you no problem it was um um, it, as I say, it's just an idea I had. I've just put it down into words. It's just, just something that sort of came to me and I've just sort of followed it through just with a little plan. Um, so it, it's just a starting point. It's, you know, we can expand it. We can go from different subjects at certain points, but it was just a starting point that I came up with because obviously everyone wants to change their skiing or change the way they um, uh, do something within snow sports. So it's just, just a bit of an idea, okay? Um, I'm going to get Mark. Mark, can you... Do your one now, is that all right? Yeah, we can do. Uh, there's just been a request in the chat for everyone to just check that they, they mute again, or if Ali, you can do mute all, because there is quite a bit yeah, of background noise going on at the moment. Are you able to do a mute all, Ali? I am just looking. Uh, I'll bring up my screen in the meantime, if I can. Should be able to. Uh, uh, you also need to enable participant screen sharing. There we go. I'm getting a very windy background noise. Is anyone else getting that? Is that just me? Yeah, lots of people have not muted themselves. If you look at the three little dots, click on them, and it gives you the op it gives you the opportunity to mute yourself. Yeah, someone has a very windy background noise. If they, if we can just get uh, everyone muted, that would be. Yeah, I think uh, I, I kind of keep getting Hussein lighting up here as uh... anyway, I'll carry on regardless. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, I, as I get started with this, uh, I, I'm not going to bother you know going through a resume or anything. There's a few people in the chat that I know and, and that know me. Um, but my name's Mark. Uh, I've worked with uh, with Ali for quite a long time. Um, 
originally I, I worked with him when he was running uh, the, the snow school in, in Milton Keynes and our ways have both kind of parted and, and come back together in, in various ways since then. So, uh, you know, we, we've kind of kept a, a connection going on there. Um, as I go through uh, this presentation, um, I, I think what you're going to see is, is actually a lot of overlap and a lot of parallels between a lot of the things that Ali has said. Um, and, and I'd say most of that is not intentional in any way shape or form um i we, we haven't we've done these presentations completely separately and just decided to talk about ended up deciding to talk about very similar things in our own way um so as i go through this I, i'm just going to kind of start off with um a bit of an info around the the topic of what i'm kind of calling a uh, you know learning and performance and really understanding the differences between them to help you practice more effectively um and so i, I one of the ways I'm going to do that once we set out a bit of information is then we'll go through an example of how we might kind of go about learning or, or, or developing a skill. I'm going to focus more on the learning side of things for the most part. Um, and, and we'll end up considering how we actually use this information to help you when, when we all can get back on snow the next time, how we can make sure we're in the right mode or the right frame set or the right mindset, whatever you want to call it. Um, as we go through this, I think for a lot of you, the, the things that I talk about and, and when I define stuff, you're probably going to think, well, that all seems pretty obvious. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I hope it does. Um, but I'll encourage you to, as, as I highlight things and talk about things, to, to think about moments where you've maybe been caught genuinely out there trying to, to learn something, to develop a new skill, to push yourself beyond where you're currently at. And you actually found yourself uh, in, a, in a more performance orientated area. Uh, and so you didn't really push things beyond where you currently were. I, I'm kind of calling this um, the, a bit of a performance trap. You know, in short, skiing well feels good. And we all want to do that more and as, and as often as we can. Making mistakes doesn't feel as good, especially in skiing where the consequences of that can be, can be fairly high. Um, sometimes so you know learning learning can be can be a tricky thing so as we go through here learning um, I'm, I'm kind of taking these these definitions um, they're kind of from how the scientific literature classifies learning and, and, and performance and I know that sounds a little boring and, and it probably is but that's that's my geeky mindset which those of you that know me are, are used to so this is basically going to help us separate learning and performance so learning is measured in the scientific studies by retention and transfer basically can you come back the next day and do it again on repeat on command or does it take you the same amount of time as the day before to get back to where you to get back to where you were in terms of the practice um, so if, if you retain it that means you can do it the next day the next week the next month the next year and obviously we know that that learning takes time so that's a bit of a gradual process um, and transfer you know if if you kind of take Ali's example of, of the World Cup racer and I've used a similar example in mine you know edging being kind of a, a pretty standout skill in, in the World Cup racer we're kind of looking at well can they do it on a slalom turn a GS turn can they do it in super G and downhill like all these different scenarios can you apply that skill in, in powder in bumps and trees wherever you want. And that's, that's the ability to transfer that skill to a variety of different situations, um, as a rough example. Uh, performance, um, I am, this is kind of like a general overview of performance, i.e. for whatever your ability and skill set is, the best that you can, can ski. It's a general kind of classification as opposed to, I'm not specifically talking about ski performance or anything like that during a turn. So performance, is generally assessed by the amount of mistakes you make. If you skied well the entire way down, we would class that as having uh, a good performance. So kind of mostly based on, on consistency. Um, and as we go through this, I, I think it's important to note that performance still requires the same focus to ski well down a slope. It's, it requires some attention, requires some focus. You know, there's a difference between not making any mistakes on the way down and not knowing that you've made any mistakes on the way down. Um, and there's also a difference between just not caring if you made any mistakes on the way down, which is fine as well. So I'm going to kind of finish with, with a couple of key points on this slide. And this is where we get into the hopefully it's obvious, 
but it might seem less obvious in, in practice as we go. So there's kind of two key points. Um, the first one being that learning can, learning can take place with no improvements to your performance. And it kind of comes down to what Ali was talking about in terms of mistakes need to be made. There's an element of trial and error in learning. So in actual fact, you might even see performance drops throughout learning as opposed to actually improves. Um, and here's the real kicker to me. This, this is the one that, that gets me every time I read it is improvements in performance can happen without any learning actually taking place. And you pro we probably notice this over the course of a, a one hour, two hour, or a full day skiing. Like we have a point where we feel like we ski better and better during the day. And then maybe it drops down again later on in the day. We come back the next day, we go through that, that same kind of performance process. So we, we haven't necessarily learned anything just because we started to ski better, because we started to ski more consistently. Hopefully you're all with me so far and that's the stuff that makes sense. Um, I had a friend randomly who's just taken a course out in Canada and by random fact, the, the trainer kind of came out with this and I asked him to kind of classify learning performance and he put it like this. Learning comes down to your developing skills. You're, you're making changes and adjustments to either new, you're either developing a new skill, making adjustments to a new skill or you're developing a current existing skill, i.e. you're taking it further in terms of the range of that skill you have, how quickly you can make it, that kind of thing. Whereas performance is about applying the skills you have, For whatever skills and ability level you have them at, you're applying those. And when you stand at the top of a run, you're just choosing how you apply it. You're making a decision on what kind of size turn you're gonna make, what speed you're gonna make, but you're not trying to go beyond where you're currently at. Here we go for the next one. So this is the, the example. How do I put this to use? Essentially what I'm gonna kind of look at, how would I go from being this guy to being this guy? Okay, guy on the right is, uh, is Mr. GS, that's Ted Ligety. Guy on the left, I have absolutely no idea who that is. That's a random picture off the internet. Um, and uh, like I said, I think the clear difference here is, is that we would kind of pick out would be edging skill. You know, our ability to increase the amount of edge angle that I have. So this is kind of the process that I would go through if, if I was either teaching someone or if I was out there myself trying, trying to learn something. So I kind of have to start with a skill-based goal. I'm trying to increase edge angle. I'm trying to, trying to do certain things, which means I need a certain amount of, of, of knowledge uh, around that, which kind of means that in order to make the ski move sideways onto its edge, well, that means I need some sideways movements with my body. You know, my, my hips have to be further inside the turn than, than my feet. Uh, my hips probably going to get closer to the snow. You know, the, the edge, the ski's going to tilt more. Um, all this kind of stuff. We need a little bit of an idea of, of, of how that's, how we're going to accomplish that, that goal. Um, as we go through that, uh, we kind of want to be aware that we're developing beyond what we currently have. So let's say the guy on the left there, that is as much edge angle as, as he can ever create. Okay. Um, and we're trying to get it, get it to increase. Now, as you do this, you kind of need to be aware of what's going to happen as you try to do this. All right. And essentially what kind of feedback you want to pay attention to. And the important part here is feedback is just information. It would be very easy to, to increase edge angle, to make that movement further inside and to end up being balanced on your inside ski, to lose your balance, to potentially even fall over. And the danger there is to translate that as a bad thing and say, well, I'm not gonna do that again and potentially limit yourself in getting that same amount of movement. As opposed to if, if I say, well, yeah, I might well end up being a bit more balanced on the inside ski as a result then I, I, I can kind of forgive myself that mistake. But then I can also pay attention to, well, what's going to happen as I increase edge angle on the ski? Well, I'm probably going to get a lot more grip. It's going to be a lot more challenging to actually skid the ski. Uh, there's going to be pressure buildup. I'm going to leave deeper tracks in the snow, all this kind of stuff. And if you're prepared with some idea of what you want to happen or what you expect to happen versus... Uh, versus what does actually happen, then you're in a position to make adjustments. You can make changes based on that. And you can also say that, well, I just fell over to the inside. Maybe that also meant that I did have more edge angle. It can be, a, a, you can take a negative and make it a positive just by classing it as information, right? 
uh, and it's really important here that when you are making these adjustments and you're paying attention to that feedback, that you stay focused on on the, that original goal of increasing edge angle. The the performance trap here for me is, like I said, when you when you say, well, I wasn't balanced on my outside ski when I did this, and you then make an adjustment to be better balanced on your outside ski as opposed to increasing your edge angle. Being a bit more performance orientated can actually take you away from your goal as opposed to taking you towards it sometimes. Uh, and the way I kind of classify that path or, or define that path is you, you'd go from that learning phase where you're really just focused on that goal and you get to a point where you've, you've learned it. You can, you can get that much edge angle on demand, but then you need to translate it into some kind of performance. The other factors need to come in in terms of, well, now how do I translate that and keep balance on my outside ski? How do I, how do I stay balanced for enough? How do I keep contact with the ground? What, whatever kind of other skills need to, need to come into it at that point in time. Okay, uh, and that really can be done by how we actually choose to practice. But the, the topic of practice schedules and, and different ways of approaching a practice session uh, uh, is a whole nother topic in and of itself. So your responsibilities when you do this, and yes, vanity shot right there, is first of all, don't sweat the small stuff. You know, learning isn't about perfection. If you go down the hill and you make a hundred turns and one of them's a bad one, well, the one we tend to focus on is, is the bad one. We, we, don't, we don't give us that freedom to say, well, hang on, I just made 99 really good ones on the way down. Um, and that's, that's a bit more of a performance orientated, but it, it comes into, into the, the learning side of things too. If, you, if you've got an objective of increasing edge angle, you can forgive yourself for other things going wrong that weren't your intention, that weren't your focus. Okay, so don't, don't sweat the small things. Um, as, you, as you go through, you know, like I said, the feedback is just useful information. Trying not to be negative or, or, or positive about it, saying that was good or bad, just treat it for what it is and use that to help you make your next, your next change, your, naked, your next adjustment. Um, and as I've already said there, it's because having a performance focus can really reverse the direction that you were going in. Um, but obviously I think one of the things that comes into people's mind is that as you go through this, well, surely I need a performance focus at some point. Yeah, you, we have to make that transition from learning to performance. And that really just comes into to how we practice and how we shift focus. There's, like I said, that kind of moves us onto a, onto a slightly different topic again. Hopefully you're all still, still with me so far. For any instructors in the room, I'll go through this pretty quick. I'm seeing Ali getting bored of me talking, so I'm sure everyone else is too. Um, every single certification, we all have our own tools, you know, and there's a lot of different associations there that are based off of a skill system uh, and the experiential learning kind of cycle from, from the literature and stuff like that. And they all put it in their own terms, but we're all doing the same thing. And it's, it's a funny concept when you think of, you know, IAZ, the CSIA, uh, uh, the Swedes, you know, there's lots of associations out there that use the experiential model yet the words they use and the pictures they use and the way that they set out that information is different for all of them, yet they're all doing the exact same thing. So when you consider what your, what your role is, it's, you're just trying to take your learner on a journey. And hopefully that's kind of what I just showed to you is what a learning journey can be like. And you just then insert whatever knowledge, whatever tools, whatever, whatever skill set you have, into that framework, into that structure to help any students you have learn. Um, and for me, the, the key around that has really been about keeping focused on what I want that student to learn, what I want them to develop, as opposed to the performance aspect of good skiing. And that's because learning, learning is hard. It's fun, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard. But I think when we accomplish those things and we stay focused on that and we keep it positive, that's when the reward kind of really comes in. That's when we feel really good about ourselves. So just to wrap things up, Ali kind of said this as well, know what you're going out to achieve. Do it sincerely, do it honestly. If you're going out there to, to learn something new, make sure that you're in that mindset. Make sure you're willing to make mistakes and to stay focused on a skill-based goal. If you're going out there to ski well, to have a good performance for whatever reason, 
then you can focus on that side of things. If you want to go out there and just not pay attention to any of that and just enjoy skiing and switch off, you can do that too. That's all fine. Just be, be very open and honest and sincere with yourself with what you're going out to do. And I had this analogy thrown at me a, a while ago, but if you, know, if you set out a target, if you only give yourself the, the bullseye, you've only got two options. You're either going to hit it or you're going to miss it. As opposed to if, you, if you're taking that idea of, as I'm developing a skill, well, maybe I need to hit that white ring, that white outer ring on the target. Uh, and it t- starts to take you into a ballpark of learning as well. Maybe my end goal should be to, to hit any, any ring at any distance under any conditions. And then you've got a pretty robust skill set that, that gives you a lot more choice in how you tackle things. And on the ski side of things, it's, well, I want to be able to make any turn with any level of ski performance at any speed on any terrain in any conditions. You know, that's a pretty lifelong goal, I think, for anyone there. It's, it sets the bar pretty high. But it, it, it just kind of classifies, it opens the world up to what IAZ believes in in making very versatile, adaptable all-mountain skiers. Um, and, and, and to me, that's kind of how I try and avoid the performance trap and, and keep myself and my students uh, on, on track and on focus there. So I'll open up to any, any questions, but I'm hoping I've uh, managed to confuse people uh, just enough that, that, that no one has any idea what to ask. Anyway, Ali, feel free to unmute yourself there. Oh. Here we go. Cheers, Mark. Anyone got any questions for Mark? Uh, well, to, uh, to answer Karen's point, would it be possible to get linked to the presentations or email link? Uh, yeah, I'm sure that's absolutely possible. That's no problem. Uh, the other one is someone leaving. So, you know, I, I did really well there. <laughs> well done, Mark. Good on you. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, ho- hopefully I didn't blow too many people's minds. I, 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 I have a tendency to be overly complicated. I, I dove into dove into some very you know the science of learning and some stuff from from previous studies this summer and and i had the chance to put some of this stuff into practice and it ended up being way more simple than i probably ended up presenting here but uh it's uh it's it's always a work in progress for me to simplify and simplify and simplify so no for me it was good that it gave um, that separation between learning and performance where you could concentrate on getting that into your noggin and into your actions and then develop the performance later, where I think there's a tendency, particularly when you're on a course, to try and do it all in a one uh, And then you stand still a lot and end up falling over a lot and get shouted at by Ali a lot uh, from present, from the past I, I experience. So thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I grimace then, grimace, grimace. Yes, <laughs> Cor- there we go. Courses are, a very, courses are a very challenging situation, you know, to, to get someone that's maybe not at the standard to the standard by the end of five or six days not a long time in the in the world of learning um i i asked uh, i happened to bump into a guy that was training for his german level for last beginning of last winter and he was going through the switch stuff they've got to be able to carve switch on their level four and he was doing that and and i asked him like how long he generally spends before he feels comfortable doing this and he said it's about 20 21 days before he feels like he's kind of got it to a point that he's comfortable with it and, and to me that sounded pretty reasonable right and, and but it's not often the amount of time that when we go away on holiday or we go away on a course we don't have 20 21 days to do that um I, I i got really geeky and i did the math on an indoor snow dome run uh, if you if you say a run down a, uh, like hemel or milton Keynes is 30 seconds and if you give yourself let's say it's maybe about 20 hours worth of skiing 20 hours worth of practice to become kind of okay at something if you translate that to we know it, we've probably heard that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to become an expert or something or 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become an expert. Well, if you look at it, it takes about 20 hours to become pretty, pretty good. That's going to take you 2,400 runs inside a snow dome at 30 seconds a piece of practice to get 20 hours worth. It, it, it kind of puts it into perspective a little bit on we need that, to, we need to give a challenge time. Yeah, but give yourself the time. It, it's okay to give yourself that time and freedom to, to make mistakes, to try things and not put pressure on yourself to ski well while you're doing it. Can I, can I just say to the, something to the instructors out there, something that I've noticed as well, and, and me, me and Ali have discussed this and sort of, you know, kind of times, but I think it's good to remember that also people have different levels of learning ability. Um, like all the technical videos, I like the technical side of skiing. I've, I've watched 
all sorts of videos. And when you start to understand the performance and the training, you can start to take bits out of the videos and you can sort of understand it a bit better. But I've always been very cautious about, you know, especially when you're in a group, you're going to get a lot of people that are you know, technically quite good and they understand the technicalities of it. And then you're going to get other people that are visual learners. You know, the, the, just, you, know you put the head in a, in a textbook and you, you're going to lose them in 10 minutes because it's just not their thing. Um, and I think it's really important for me, when I'm doing something, it's the feeling that I get. It's not about the reading or, you know, watching the video. It sort of instructively feels right when I, when you do it right, it just feels right. And I think there's a lot of people out there that have that sort of ability that, you know, when they're training, when it feels right, then it generally is right. Um, they're not going to learn it from a book. They don't understand. It just, it just doesn't go in. Um, I think a lot of the kids, a lot of the kids have this because you find a lot of the kids, you know, some of the, you know, might be a little bit on the spectrum. So they're very good at creative stuff. But if you try and drill them as an exercise, it doesn't work. It, it, it's got to be do it. And you know, for me, it's always been about repeat this. So I'm going to be spending those twenty four thousand hours of the stuff. <laughs> not not twenty four thousand hours, just just two thousand four hundred runs. <laughs> well, runs. <laughs> Just to throw a different perspective on that, you're absolutely right in, in everything you said there. We, we definitely need to be able to adapt our approaches to people. I, I will say this in terms of um, considering yourself a feeler or, or, or paying attention to feelings as an internal form of feedback. Do bear in mind that sometimes what feels good is the same as what you've always done. We're all aware yeah. of that saying that change is strange. So just be aware that sometimes your feelings can flat out lie to you. All right. Sometimes you need to feel bad. Sometimes you need to pay attention more to what the ski did on the snow, the tracks that you left, more external forms of feedback as well. Just to just to throw two sides of the same same coin there. But definitely some people are going to do something, do exactly what you asked, and it's going to feel amazing straight away. And you're like, sweet, hang on to that. So there's there's two sides of that same coin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Um Little round of applause for, for Mark there, much appreciated. And um, um, both Mark's and my presentations, it, like just sort of going on what you said there, Mark, they've come from just a slightly different viewpoint, different way of delivering the information. And, and you know, that is an important uh, subject in how we cover everyone's different process of learning. And, and that can be a subject we can look at in the future. Um, but hopefully you've got a little something from each of the presentations that me and Mark have done. We've, we've sort of tried to keep it condensed, but still try and keep enough information in there that makes sense, hopefully, to, to, um, to you all out there. And um, we'll put on some more presentations going forward and we'll look through all of the, um, the list of um, um, points that you've raised in the, in the chat. I'll, I'll make sure that all those points are covered and then we'll put some stuff together for, for the rest of this month and into... Um, March as well. Um, we, we're going to sign off in a minute, but if, before we go, if anyone's got any questions or want to just raise a point now or just want to say something or um, just mention anything at all, feel free to. If you want to put a question to Julie, she is here now as well. So feel free to say hello to Julie and uh, put your points across. Um, yeah, that was a question. <laughs> I, I will just throw in my two cents out for anyone that's that's leaving suggestions of things they'd like to see. It, I, I've seen a lot of stuff in the chat that's uh, lots of cool stuff with regards to interested in, in touring and the equipment and the setups. Uh, lots of stuff with regards to course preparation and standards and content and things like that. It, it can be very generally based too, you know, it can be things that you're seeing on YouTube that, that people are talking about and you want to want to get our take on it as well. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of common talk around uh, a lot of a lot of YouTube and videos and stuff out there focusing around transitions in skiing these days and and uh, you know there, there's certainly a I, I could very happily throw some opinions and, and ideas out there at people on that one as well so um, anyway it can be literally anything that you guys want to talk about and if, if no one's got any ideas now you can always email us you can send us a message through whatsapp or messenger and um, yeah, just just let us know as and when, and we can uh, we can put these sessions on each week. Um, we can do two a week if need be. So um, we've we've got time on our hands. So hence we're going to do more of these. Yes, go on. Yeah. Hi, Ali. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I'm doing a certain amount of exercises at the moment, 
regarding getting fit for when we're allowed to go to Hemel and then yeah. eventually the mountains. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully not too long. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Um, and, um, getting some exercises. What what exercises would you recommend without a slope? Um, I mean, per personally, it, I go for what I like doing, which is normally riding my bike, doing a little bit of a an aerobic workout, um, dog walking with Bruce, um, some gentle weights if and when I get the energy to do that. Um, but it's whatever fits into your lifestyle, your routine and what you like doing. Because, you know, fitness is one of those hard things to, to really get motivated into doing. If it's something you know you need to do but you don't like doing, it can sometimes be tough. I, I enjoy fitness. Um, really? I'm trying to do ones that are specific to skiing. So I've got a... Um, rotation table which which actually is for elderly people and i don't really need it <laughs> <laughs> but i'm using it i've adapted it for rotation for rotation so yeah. instead of because we haven't got a slippery floor it's all carpeted here it works. um so what i've done is i've got a rotation table i turn one way i do all the releasing of my knees lifting up going down trying to do it slowly and turning yeah. um so i'm doing that for the rotation oh. can i, I just do start, it, ball. sorry can i can i just ask that is, yeah. is, is that one platform that you stand on with both feet yeah it, it's a platform it's a big one though yeah, it's 18, not the smaller inch. ones it, it, it's, it's going to be interesting. If, if you took video of yourself on that yeah. to try and practice some rotation it'd be very interesting to see because i think you'd see a difference between standing on one solid platform and having a platform yeah. under each foot you'd see quite a big quite oh, a big difference all right i have actually got two as well yeah, because you're probably going to end up rotating your hips if you stand on one platform doing that, as okay. opposed to actually turning your leg in your hips. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, 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 look at that. That's yeah, thank you. interesting. Mind blown right there, eh? Yeah. Helen, that's, that's Helen can you hear me? Yes, hello. Helen. Hi, hi everyone. Um, for that exercise that this person um, wants to do, what you find is if you go to the local parks where we are, I don't know if they've got them in your area, they've got lots of um, apparatus. There's one in a park whereby you stand two feet on, you, have, you hold on to a, a solid bar, a fixed bar, and you, you rotate your hips and feet. Is yeah, I know, I know what you're talking about, yeah. yeah. Is that similar? They have those in the local parks. No, no, no. It's the bar with, oh, a, thing, bar. with a spinner at the bottom. Oh. That's it. That's the one. Yeah. I find that very good. I'll have to find one. <laughs> Just, yeah. just, yeah. just, just check out the local parks. Just as a general thanks for saying. Fitness, um, just for for everyone, it's it's obviously our core position is our strong stomach, back, arms, shoulders, etc. You know, we, we want that core to be as uh, strong and as, as tight as we can for when we ski. And obviously, leg muscles are important. So I'm not a, I'm not a fitness fanatic myself. I'm not um, um, uh, a fitness expert by any stretch of the imagination, um, but it's, it's to look at the key areas that we use in skiing. So your core, your legs, and it's just build things around those specific needs for skiing. And whether it is weights, whether it's cycling, swimming, whether it is doing what you're doing on the, um, the rotational boards, squats, you know, some, um, some sitting against the, the wall that, I've seen people do it. Yeah, it's, it's just find what works for you. But the core is, the, is one of the crucial things. And we always talk about you know, having a stable core. So something to help with that. And then get the legs, legs going. And it doesn't necessarily have to be weights. It can be, you know, as long as you're out there walking and doing regular exercise with the, with the legs in that way, that's, that's absolutely fine. But again, fit it just, in just, for you. Yeah, just to throw some stuff in, because the, there's some suggestions from the chat. Uh, Jez is saying there's an app called SkiFit, which you know tailors to, to very different levels and things like that. So if you want some more guidance and something you could download, that that could be a suggestion. Uh, Linda's saying Pilates. Um, I, I've actually gotten myself into some some very beginnery yoga stuff and yoga and mobility and stretching, and it's 
I, I, I'm absolutely shocked and amazed at how much fun I have doing that. Um, my other two ones, my other two kind of areas is I'm cycling a lot. I got an indoor, indoor trainer in, in Zwift and I think without that I'd be feeling pretty lost at the moment. Yeah. But I'd also be doing about the same as, as, I, as I was um, two months ago if I wasn't also doing some resistance training, some strength and building that up. Yeah, I'm doing that. Um, but I will say that the resistance training, the, the, the lifting, the weights and stuff like that is hands down my least enjoyable uh, element of it. But um, it, it, to me, Ali's right. Do, do what you enjoy more than anything else. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. This, this is good. That's what I've got. I've got one of them. As no, well. no, it's like no, it's similar. For one leg. For one leg. Yeah, one leg. Two of those on one leg. The other leg, you go around the clock. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I've got a big one, a big ball a flat one. with a flat top. This yeah. one is not flat. No, that's so you have to balance on it with one leg and then with the other leg you go around the clock. Do you know what I mean? One o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Balancing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Susie. There we it's go. Like... <laughs> that's that's okay. a great um, it's great exercise for proprioception there, really get, uh, developing the, the small balance muscles when you do stuff like that. It's, uh, I actually had a, I had a physio exercise for that, for a very similar one, um, recovering from knee surgery. It's, it's way, more, way harder than you think too. Yeah, it is hard, yeah. Yes. Stand on yeah. one leg when you're cleaning your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing this holding my leg up while I'm ironing. Yeah. <laughs> the oh, balance. Good. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Good ideas, yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, it's been a good session, Ali. Thank you. But absolute pleasure, guys. And what, what I'll do is I've, I've recorded this, so I'm going to stick it onto the, the website. Yeah. So if you want to go back and look at any of these ideas, I'm going to get all the information from the chat and um, list down the ideas that everyone's been mentioning on there. And then um, um, we'll plan another one for next week. And um, if, if a daytime one doesn't fit, we can look at doing a nighttime one as well. Um, but we, we will keep these going through the, the all, of, all of February and all of March. But, you know, as I say, feel free to message us, send us a, an email on any ideas or things you want to talk about. If you want to sort of just keep it more general as we are now, we'll keep continuing to do the presentations and uh, we'll go from there. So um, I think Julie wants to just say a quick proper hello. And, oh, um, hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> hello, Julie. <laughs> Oh, it's nice to see people's faces, not just his. <laughs> what, what's, he, what's he done to your dog? He's oh. worn him out. <laughs> well, there he is. Oh. 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 Poor little pet. Julie? Better now. Julie, why were you laughing at Ali's uh, exercise routine and regime? <laughs> you, you know why she's laughing at that. I shouldn't be, though, Paul. <laughs> Is that because it's fictitious? <laughs> I think I know what he does. That I know what his training routine is. Yeah. <laughs> it's gin, not water. No, that's that's water. That's water, everyone. It's gin. It's, it is coming up to three o'clock, and that normally is the the wine o'clock time. So you know, we're <laughs> the, the yard arm level. <laughs> Can I just say one last thing about the exercising? Um, Go for it, mate. Yeah, it, all the things that we've been discussing are very good. You know, the, the, any form of cardio, weights, anything like that. But I think when you get to a certain age as well, and I, I think there's a few of us that are of a certain age out there, um, protecting your body is really important because when you fall, that's when you'll get the injuries because your body is not mobile. Uh, it's not flexible enough. And you read a lot of articles by the top skiers, the alpine skiers, all the GS skiers. Main thing that they concentrate on, obviously, they've got their weights and all that sort of stuff. But the thing that they do regularly is yoga. And I have to say, for someone who suffered with a bad back for the last 10 years, I started doing yoga at the beginning of the lockdown, uh, the last lockdown, and my back's never been better. And it really, and it really has helped my flexibility and um, Ali knows because of my back injury I've got a bit of a rotation issue on one side and that's really the best it's been for a long time and the, the thing with the yoga it, it encompasses all three because it's, there's balance strength and you know it, it, and it's all through the core as well um, so yeah just 
have a little go, you, you know, but pick, pick something that's, I think the key with yoga is, I, I went to a lesson with my wife who's been doing it for 10 years, it nearly killed me, I couldn't walk for a week. <laughs> so start slowly, yeah. really, you know, start slowly, build up. Yeah, I, I have, I have, uh, I've, I've had some back issues myself and I've had friends that have had back issues uh, for various reasons and, and finding something that you can have like as a 10, 15 minute morning routine every yeah. day when you go skiing, you, you'd be shocked and amazed at the world of difference it can make to have something at the beginning and end of your day. And, and maybe yoga is for you, it isn't for you, but I, 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 I the benefits of it seem pretty huge to me in terms of, in terms of yeah. mobility. It, it, I mean, I, I go with a group of, Ads when we go skiing, it's quite competitive, um, and I'm amazed. I'm the only one in the group that after after we've had a drink and we're all back at the apartment, I'm the only one who stretches out. And you know that's really important as well. Is look after yourself after the skiing because it'll make you so much more supple the next morning as well. So spend 15, 20 minutes when you come back, just do a few stretches and get the body calm down, you know, warm down, um, and you'll feel a lot better for it in the mornings as well. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Excellent. Good. Or have a glue yeah. mark. Yeah. You know. yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm not drinking enough. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if people want us to share some, like, I, I find a lot of videos and stuff on YouTube with regards to, to anything yoga or skiing related, if people want us to share what we're looking at and, and using as a, as a starting point, I, I'm sure we could, uh, we could, spend at least one presentation just just looking at some stuff if you wanted and it, we wouldn't even have to look at everything just uh, a well, few we'll snippets of what we found and where we found it warren smith uh sorry should i say that name he's, <laughs> got some time. he's actually got some dry ski uh slope exercises that you can yeah, use to, you know exercises that are warm-ups yeah yeah no, there's a lot of good stuff out there, and various companies do cover cover lots of that. Um, so, you know, like Mark just said, on YouTube, we can gather some bits of information. We can get some... I know Warren personally, I can get him to send me some stuff, and we can go through it and chat about that. So we can, we can chat about whatever you all would like to chat about. So um, feel free to just keep letting us know. All right? Um, I, I am going to sign it all off now, because it's, uh, it's 2.30. I'm surprised you're not... Have a good week. But um, thank, you. thank you for all taking part and um, look forward to hopefully seeing you all again soon. See you all soon. Bye. 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 Are you, uh, are you able to save that chat, Ali? Yeah, I'm just going to go through and have a look at it now. Um, save I, chat. I think you can literally just, just save it. Yeah, it's, I'll just click on chat, saved, show in folder. Um, I'll find that, so that's cool. I, I didn't time myself there. How long did I spend talking? Too long. You just went on no, forever. No, joking, talk. joking. <laughs> all, all, good, all good. But um, I'll, um, I'll, I'm going to record it. It's well, still recording now. I'll cut it off, then I'll stick it onto the, the website, and um, then people can go back and look at it. So we'll, uh, we'll sign out now. Mark, I really like the... Um... Oh. Bullseye analogy. Oh, yeah. I, I that was um, given to me by a, a guy that, that's a, prof a strength and conditioning professor at the university um, in Canada where I worked. Mm. I, I bend his ear on a, on a on a lot of stuff. I I've got a scaffolding analogy too that's really good. Um, but yeah, I, I I like that. I like that target analogy. It's like yeah. we always just seem to aim for the bullseye, and it's like, well, you, you're just being a dick to yourself, really. Yeah. But, but it's so true in, in whatever we do. It is like we always want to get perfect and get that centre spot. And that is such a, a simple analogy or way to look at it because it is like, well, yeah, you're right. Why don't you just try gradually getting closer to it or select a little bit more on the outside and multitask. Yeah, I, I, I've adapted it simply, but I thought I'd keep it simple today because obviously the dart board is, is, is more applicable to that. The darts player has to be able to hit any single part of that board to bring his score down accurately. And yeah. It, it, it highlights it even more, but I, I'd stuck with that one for today because I found a nice picture. <laughs> no, so. that, that, that was good. It was good. And I've had a few private messages and people said they liked it, loved it. It's great, you know, really informative. So um, yeah, I, I didn't, didn't look at how long either of us was. Um, I, know, I know we didn't, we didn't get started until about um, 20, 20, yeah. 
Um, but um, yeah, in all honesty, that that could have been a two-hour just chat with people. To be honest with you, no, it, it um, possibly the way that lot was going. Yeah, gone on that way, and it might be that at some point we might just do something like that, um, just for the. Yeah, well, I, I hope I hope what it's done is just fueled a few a few ideas for them. Really, like I I don't know if you saw the chat with regards to some of the stuff they were saying that they wanted. But it was very much course orientated or touring orientated. There wasn't much outside of that. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't know. It, yeah. Presentation then. Will both? Will you do?